Revolution Radio proudly presents, live from the heart of the Blue Ridge, Roanoke, Virginia, it's the Just Bernard Show with host Bernard Alvarez. Join Bernard as he shares topics that reveal the real matrix and empower your human experience, including world liberty, the esoteric, suppressed technologies, spiritual ascension, and human consciousness. Humanity has awakened, and our time has come to realize our full potential. And now, live from the Star City, your host, Bernard Alvarez. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Just Bernard Show here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We are broadcasting live here on Studio A, and I've got a really fantastic show for you today. I know every sh- I say that about every week, but I've been looking uh, very much forward to this particular show. In just a few moments, we're going to be speaking uh, with Ali al Jabira, and uh, we're going to be discussing the truth about the Iraq war uh, in just a few minutes. But uh, before we uh, bring Ali on to the show, I just wanted to thank you all for joining in. And I hope that if you are listening, you are signed into the chat and join the discussion. I wanted to let all of you know that uh, our associate produ- our assistant producer, Treva Knott, is not going to be joining us today. Uh, Treva needs to take a day off, and I don't blame her. So... Uh, while she's out of uh, off, I would like to let you know that I am going to do my best uh, to keep an eye on the chat. So if you do have any questions, I am actually signed in as Bernard, I believe. Uh, so if uh, those of you in the chat room, if you have any questions for myself or for our lead during the broadcast, you just let us know. Type it into the chat room, and I will make sure that uh, we try to answer it for you here live on the show. It's been uh, quite a great week, I will say. I have been uh, a really busy person uh, trying to keep up uh, <laughs> with my work, uh, not only on this particular radio show and uh, as well on the Global Illumination Council. i got to tell you, I've got some fantastic guests coming up for you guys in the next couple of weeks, as well as, of course, today, uh, we're speaking about the Iraq War. But just uh, before I do forget, I want to let you all know that one of our favorites, uh, Jeff Harvey, will be joining us uh, next week uh, to be talking about, of course, alternative healing methods. Uh, He's going to be focusing on H3O, which is pretty cool because I had just been um, researching that very thing several weeks ago. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you, uh, I don't know if I've spoken about this on the show yet. I'm pretty sure I have. Uh, my cat of uh, Jesus, 13 years old now, and she ended up with skin cancer a few months ago. And I didn't want to go through the chemo. I didn't actually. I don't. I can't afford to pay for chemo and and move. They wanted me to move out of state and do chemo and radiation on this poor little creature, and I just couldn't do it. And so I was uh, researching alternative uh, healing methods. I came up with um, Amazon Black Salve, and it's doing a really good job. One of her lesions has already uh, healed right up. Her hair has grown back and everything. But the other thing I was researching was H3O. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hear what Jeff Harvey is uh, going to be sharing with us. Uh, as you know, he's uh, been on the show many times and is uh, an excellent alternative healer with great methods uh, that you're not going to find uh, in the world of pharmacopoeia or uh, corporate pharmacology, I should say. <clears throat> but anyway... Um, there has been quite a bit of news this week, and uh, in keeping with our, our talk about the Iraq War, it, it, I feel like uh, the the imperial war in the Middle East is much greater than just the Iraq War, and we're probably going to talk about that. But just recently, uh, I believe there's an investigation going on right now into Pakistan where uh, it looks like the CIA uh, did a false uh, immunization or vaccination program while they were, quote, unquote, looking for Saddam Hussein. And now there is a huge outbreak of polio in the region. There are now several states and countries around the world where you now must get a polo shot if you are leaving or traveling to the, that particular country. So is the CIA responsible for creating a new polio outbreak? Uh, it's a very good question to ask. Uh, we do have information on the website. If you would like to learn more, you can go to thegic.org. I believe it's the latest featured um, um, blog there, 
but uh, you know, you, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what's well. We all know. That's why you're tuning into this radio show. <laughs> There's a lot of nasty people trying to screw the planet up, and they're doing a really good job, and it's time for us to speak up and speak out. And that's why I am here, and that's why you're here listening to this particular radio show and this radio station. So without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about my guest. Um, Ali was uh, actually brought to my attention through our mutual uh, friend, Doreen Hassan. She is, of course, the woman that was on several months ago who created that wonderful documentary on the uh, Syrian situation over there in the, um, of the exiles. And uh, I, I, got, I was able to uh, look at some of Ali's work. I saw a wonderful presentation of his, and uh, I, I realized this is a really important topic. And let me tell you why it's an important topic to me. For those of you who have been following my work for the last eight years, think about the timing of this. When the Iraq War started, that is when... I got on my activist uh, high horse. That is when I said, enough is enough. I can't do this anymore. I quit my job, and I started doing radio and writing books and starting websites. The, the Iraq War was actually very much a part of the reason why I do what I do today. So it's very important to me. And when I had the opportunity uh, to have someone who knows more, uh, more than I do, I'm sure, as to the situation on the ground over there as well, as uh, you know, just the the devastation that was uh, that that has been you know done over there, I, I felt this was a really good opportunity for us to have a fantastic show, and uh, ask this gentleman to come join us live uh, here today. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Ali Al Jabir. He is uh, he was uh, an Iraqi journalist. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. He's living in the Netherlands now and is a former lecturer of international relations as well as a political scientist. So without further ado, let me welcome you to the show, Ali. How, I'm so, very good to have you on today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. And, and am I correct in saying you're in the Netherlands right now? Yes, I am in the Netherlands. Okay, great, great. So, um, Ali, uh, tell, me, uh, tell us, uh, the listeners and myself, a little bit of uh, what got you motivated to go down this path of, well, becoming a journalist on Iraq, becoming a, a, a lecturer of international relations and political science. What were the, perhaps, the, uh, the chapters in your life that, that, that kind of pushed you in this direction? Uh, well, I think I, I started s studying international relations and um, trying to learn about Iraq as well as other places in the world because I'm interested in understanding how politics works as I realize that it is, uh, in the end, a political struggle um, that is necessary to fundamentally change the world uh, and make it a more peaceful and um, just place. Right, right. And and it, can you tell us uh, where you grew up? Did you grow up in Iraq or in the Middle East or in the Netherlands? No, in fact, I grew up in the Netherlands. Uh, we uh, fled Iraq in the early 90s uh, uh, at the end of the Gulf War. Uh, at the time, um, Saddam Hussein was uh, bombing uh, Iraq uh, to, to crush an uprising uh, against Saddam Hussein. And the United States Army uh, actively sought Saddam Hussein's victory uh, against that uprising yeah. by allowing Saddam Hussein to use air force against uh, unarmed civilians uh, and in order to make sure that he stays in power. And the political reason behind that, of course, is that the U.S. wasn't sure about those who would take over if the uprising would be successful. They had not established sufficient relationships with them yet and so couldn't make sure that they would function as a puppet regime as the current Iraqi government uh, functions. Uh, what is very interesting, though, is that uh, um, some of the major groups who were involved in that uprising and would probably take over the country, at least in the beginning, had they succeeded, are now ruling in Iraq, uh, but they only could could rule when they when the U.S. had established sufficient relations relations with them and made sure that they became dependent on U.S. support to maintain control of Iraq, and as a result of which they can be controlled by the United States yeah. to a large extent. Um, that bombing that Saddam Hussein engaged in of uh, Iraq was uh, very bloody and horrific. It is estimated that um, that uprising and uh, its aftermath uh, led to the killing of about 200,000 uh, people in Iraq, 
and uh, so the United States is uh, is complicit in that crime. Yes, absolutely, and and I I can't help but uh, point out, especially to our listeners, I myself, who I consider myself uh, quite fluent. Uh, in the politics uh, of war and the United States imperialism, especially in the Middle East, growing up uh, as an activist. That is one part that is not really discussed, what you just mentioned. Uh, now, what, what you just mentioned about uh, Saddam Hussein bombing Iraqis, that was uh, prior to the Gulf War? No, this is after the Gulf uh, oh. War. Uh, in, in, well, what is called the Gulf War, the 1991 war following Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. Right, right. Um, the uprising was, uh, you know, at the end of that war, um, making use of Saddam Hussein's weakening as a result of that war and the Iraqi army's presence in the south of Iraq and in Kuwait. Um, uh, almost spontaneously, an uprising um, happened in the south of Iraq as well as in the north of Iraq and um, apparently it was pretty successful about 14 out of 18 provinces in Iraq were um, liberated from Saddam Hussein's control um, and according to General Schwarzkopf who uh, led the, in, the war on behalf of the Americans in 1991 um, probably the uprising would have been successful um, had uh, the United States Army not allowed Saddam Hussein to use air force against the population. Uh, but anyway, whether it would have been successful or not, uh, the most important point to me is, uh, as a citizen of the West at this moment, is the uh, in involvement of the West yeah. led by the United States in the perpetuation of one crime after another against the Iraqi people and, uh, and, and preventing the emergence of democracy there. Of true democracy, absolutely. I, I can't help but, um, uh, and, and forgive me if I'm going backwards in our conversation, uh, and, and of course I'm trying to, 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 to gauge this in the perspective of an American citizen of what we were shown on the news, uh, what CNN and everyone was reporting. Um, now, prior to the Kuwait invasion, quote unquote, I don't even know, if, you know what the details are of that, if it was real or staged or whatnot, however... What, what I'd like to know is, is it true that Saddam Hussein was um, committing genocide against certain people prior to that? Um, Saddam Hussein committed genocide against the Kurds um, in the 1980s. At the end of the 80s, yeah, he yeah. implemented so -called, the so-called Operation El Anfal. Um, it is estimated that about 200,000 Kurds were uh, killed uh, in that operation. Uh, what is important is the following. Saddam Hussein was carrying, carrying, out, carrying out this genocide with the approval and active military support of the West. Um, Saddam Hussein received throughout the 1980s weapons from, amongst others, the United States. He was considered a major ally of the United States, so much so that he was made an honorary citizen of the city of, uh, of, of Detroit. Oh, my um, and when an American delegation visited Saddam Hussein and he complained about the one or two articles that appeared that were critical of Saddam Hussein's regime, he was very quickly assured and told, well, you know, this is how a free press, quote unquote, works. And he was also told that a journalist working for the Voice of America uh, was um, fired when he criticized Saddam Hussein. Um, the Netherlands, where I'm from, was the second largest provider of chemical weapons gases to Saddam Hussein throughout the 1980s, even though the Dutch government knew in 1982 um, that Saddam Hussein was committing, uh, uh, you know, war crimes using yeah. chemical weapons. Uh, they were told of this by their own um, ambassador in Baghdad. And nonetheless, the support for Saddam Hussein continued. And the result of it is, amongst others, the killing of 200,000 Kurds. And you must understand that uh, an imperial force like the United States and its supporters, because the U.S. does not act alone, uh, supporters are, amongst others, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom, um, they are not very um, concerned with the lives of citizens. They are not concerned with democracy. In fact, they are opposed to democracy. As long as the strong man that they support carries, carries out their directives, they don't really care about how many victims he kills in the process. Um, victims are only important from the perspective of imperial forces 
and the media that usually regurgitate the official point of view. Um, when those victims are the victims of a perceived enemy. So there is hardly any American citizen or a Dutch citizen who has not heard of the chemical gas attacks um, in uh, Damascus. Uh, right. One, because the government in, uh, in uh, Syria is now a perceived enemy and they were quickly blamed, although we still have no proof of their involvement in those attacks, they were quickly blamed by official sources in the West that they were the culprits and therefore the victims of that act of war uh, and of crime uh, became what is called in the literature worthy victims, victims about whom we should care because our enemies killed them and we can use them in order to justify our own military intervention, for example, in Syria. But when victims are uh, the result of the acts of a perceived ally, you will never hear anyone talk about them. So how many American citizens have heard about the tens of people who have been killed in Bahrain during the so-called Arab Spring mm. and the torture that occurred there? Hardly anyone. And the right. reason is clear. Bahrain is an ally. How many people hear of the torture that the current government of Iraq is perpetuating? The prisons that were operated by Saddam Hussein and in which political opponents were tortured. Uh, and later in those prisons, the UK and the United States were torturing and imprisoning um, um, uh, uh, victims now are operated by the security forces of the Maliki government of Iraq. Hardly anyone talks about this in Western media. Why? Well, the Maliki government is considered an ally, so the victims that Maliki makes are unworthy victims. Yeah, it's, it's all about uh, perception and, and trying to, uh, well, to sell their message and, and quote-unquote democracy, which it really is not. Uh, going back a little bit, I, I can't help but uh, think about uh, in the United States, there was a, a big, a bit of an uproar during the uh, the Iraq War when it first started, uh, when the United uh, United Nations Security Council edited the twelve thousand page report, uh, Iraqi weapons report, and they had edited out all the names of the U.S. companies that had sold weapons and materials to Iraq in the past. I would assume this is during the uh, the the genocide of the Kurds. Uh, is there? Is there any way to know their names? Do you know the names of these U.S. companies? Um, and uh, are, are they now active uh, in Iraq? Are they back active making more money now? Well, uh, I, I'm, at the moment, I don't have those details, but I'm sure if you spend enough time on it, you'll, you'll be able to find something. Um, what is well nice between quotation marks about the, the time we're living in is that we have access to a lot of information that is yeah. sufficient to understand uh, the workings of imperialism. Um, however, it's very hard to find and you have to spend enough time to find out, for example, what companies were involved in Iraq um, selling weapons, etc. We know, of course, that American com companies were selling weapons to Saddam Hussein and we know for a fact now that American companies are making tens of millions of dollars uh, from uh, selling weapons and other matters to uh, to the Iraqi government. Um, that's not really something that is uh, that is disputed. And um, you had mentioned uh, about the the motivation of uh, these uh, so-called, you know, they call it the coalition forces uh, back in the day when it first started, uh, and perhaps now even. Uh, is it fair to say that not only were they trying to, well, just like you said, Trying to um, trying to gain power for their particular forces or their particular country, but in the as as a coalition of the United States, uh, was were they paid by the United States? Were they a coalition of the billing instead of the willing? Well, I don't have details on this again, like documentary evidence. Okay. But if you would use common sense, um, you would of course understand that there's a great likelihood that in making coalitions, the United States offers to some countries or, or parties certain rewards. And in return for these rewards, these countries will participate. But I think Western governments like the Netherlands and the United Kingdom had enough interests of their own to be involved in the war in Iraq. Uh, so the UK government, like the US government, promotes the interests of multinational corporations who were seeking access to the Iraqi market 
in particular the Iraqi oil market. Don't forget that um, multinational corporations were forced to leave Iraq in the early 70s and could only return after the invasion. And of course, oil in itself was a primary, if not the primary concern to the United States and their allies, the so-called coalition of the willing or billing, if you will. Um, and the point to them was to gain not only access to Iraqi oil, but be able to control it. Because the United States does not only seek access, but control of the resource that is the lifeblood of the world economy. And this is why you must make sure that you are able to uh, block access to that resources by, for instance, governments or corporations that you do not favor. And you also have to make sure, for example, that you have some control over the price of oil. And we know from the documentary evidence that the United States, as well as their allies, have a great interest in this. Um, another very important aspect uh, in terms of interest behind the Iraq war are, of course, the interests that you've already mentioned of multinational corporations. The Iraqi market um, is now very, uh, very open to multinational corporations. Um, the Iraqi uh, economic structure is very close to the neoliberal dream, uh, uh, a neoliberal system being a system that permits almost unbridled access to multinational corporations who could move in uh, a country um, and virtually own the entire economy and export their profits abroad, leaving the population with uh, you know, very little uh, in terms of uh, economic development or uh, poverty alleviation. And this is what has happened in Iraq. So, for instance, uh, we know that now Cargill, uh, the largest uh, grain exporter in the world and an American co uh, company, has gained access to Iraq after the invasion that this access was engineered by the Coalition Provisional Authority, which was the uh, government of Iraq under the leadership of Paul Bremer um, right after the invasion. Uh, by the way, the Coalition Provisional Authority, just to illustrate, was officially a department of the Pentagon, and this department of the Pentagon was ruling Iraq by decree. And uh, some of these decrees were about the Iraqi agricultural markets. The Iraqi agricultural market was opened, there was no more protection for Iraqi farmers, and the potentially lucrative Iraqi market, which could have developed and uh, meant something for Iraqi people, was sold, um, uh, between quotation marks, to companies such as Cargill. At the moment, uh, Iraqi uh, land is hardly being used uh, to grow um, uh, crops, and Iraqi farmers are out of business, uh, and the reason is simple. Um, the subsidized grains from the United States are now being exported to Iraq. Those suffering from this are Iraqi people because now they are buying food that is uh, more expensive than it could be. Iraqi farmers and potential uh, 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 agricultural workers are suffering because they are, they're out of a job. Those who are gaining are the multinational corporations and their enforcers, the enforcers being the local political economic elite of Iraq that ensures that the American blueprint, blueprint of a neoliberal economy um, is maintained and is not uh, threatened by some sort of uprising. Wow, that's a lot. To, I, I can't help but um, I'm visualizing. I'm, there was a, um, a satire movie that was released here several years ago called War, Inc. And uh, I, I, I thought it was a bit of a, a stretch as far as like comically, but the way you're, you're, the way you're describing um, how... Business is being done is exactly how this movie portrays it. So I have to definitely have to suggest that to everybody if you uh, have the opportunity to uh, watch this movie called War Inc. Uh, it's everything you just described. <laughs> everything you just described being portrayed as a satire. I'll read something to you uh, from The Guardian. I'm, I'm sitting behind my laptop while yeah. I'm talking to you. Um, about the Iraqi agricultural market. It's just an illustration. This goes for all sectors in Iraq. Uh, the Guardian at the time wrote the following, I'll, I'll quote, uh, they wrote, Kevin Watkins, Oxfam's policy director, Oxfam being a major NGO in the development sector in the world, said that Mr. Umstutz, and this Umstutz was the man who was put in charge of the Iraqi agricultural reform program uh, by the uh, Americans, and Umstutz was a, a, a former top employee of Cargill, and according to this, uh, um, to Oxfam, Umstutz would arrive with a suitcase full of open market rhetoric and was more likely to try to dump cheap U.S. grain on the potentially lucrative Iraqi market. 
uh, putting Amstutz in charge of agricultural reconstruction is like putting Saddam Hussein in the chair of a human rights commission. Huh. And of course, all for profit and control, it seems to be, um, as far as the, the grain is concerned. And, and I can't help, and right now, one of our big issues in the United States is um, uh, the genetically modified organism issue, uh, Monsanto and patent the patents on the grain and the seeds and, and whatnot, and I mean, now they're mixing genes with uh, fish and humans and, and, and strawberries all mixed together, and, and we're not, we don't even know what the health effects are going to be. I can't help but wonder if this is a way to impose the Monsanto mentality in Iraq as well. Well, Monsanto is definitely in Iraq, huh. and uh, the same uh, person I men mentioned, Dan Umstutz, who was put in charge of reconstructing Iraqi agriculture, by the way, reconstructing Iraqi agriculture is a technical word for giving the Iraqi agricultural sector to multinational corporations whilst not allowing Iraqis to have any say over that. There were many protests amongst Iraqis as well as uh, uh, non-Iraqis against, for example, the reforms in the agricultural sector imposed by the Americans, but they were not taken into account. This Dan Umstutz, uh, before taking the job of uh, opening up the Iraqi agricultural market, uh, was a lobbyist for GM Foods in the United States. He was uh, pretty successful at that. And uh, he made sure, of course, that the laws of Iraqi agriculture have been uh, written such that uh, GM Foods can now be exported to Iraq um, uh, very easily compared to other countries, probably uh, uh, even more easily than uh, in the United States. Uh, and the average Iraqi, if you would ask them about it, of course, they are not informed about all of these things. Um, and uh, they probably don't know what they are eating. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> Ali, we've got to uh, take a commercial break in just a few seconds. And I, I want to thank you for, uh, for everything that you're sharing with us right now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when we return, we're going to continue our discussion with Ali Al-Jabira and uh, uh, Basically, pick up where we left off, talk about the situation, the understanding of the Iraqi citizens, and uh, some of the uh, other reasons why the United States uh, decided to invade Iraq. We'll be right back. And now, back to your host, Bernard Alvarez. Welcome back to the Jess Bernard Show here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I hope that you are joining us live, and if, you're, if you are, please uh, go ahead and log into the chat room. We are very happy to take your questions. I am logged in as Bernard if you'd like to ask me a question or my guest, Ali Al-Jabira. Uh, today we are discussing the truth of the, about the Iraq war uh, from someone who, uh, who grew up there, uh, was a journalist uh, and is now a political scientist, Ali Al Jabir. Thank you for uh, for sticking around, Ali. Um, I have, um, a, 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 I guess, a Western question, an American question as to why we invaded uh, Iraq. I mean, of course, we all heard the the pounding of the drums of the uh, the weapons of mass destruction, um, and as well as the uh, sectarian divide between the the Sunnis and the Shia. Uh, what was the, what is your um, perception on what was going on in the ground at the time George Bush decided to invade Iraq? Was there a uh, an all-out civil war, or was it kind of a small sectarian battle going on? Well, before George Bush invaded the country, there was no sectarian, uh, nor any other kind of civil war. There was. Um, uh, uh, these, the, what is described as a civil war and sectarian tension only emerged sometime after the invasion and was the direct result of that invasion. Hmm. But of course, this kind of idea was present in the American press as well as in the Western press, which is again to justify the invasion. Because if yeah. there is a mess somewhere going on, having a white supremacist savior complex the average um, citizen might easily accept the invasion because we, the West, the enlightened democratic forces of the world, must invade a place in order to make it more peaceful. Uh, that's how twisted the logic is. Yeah, invade yeah. a place, bomb it to make it more, more peaceful. Destabilize it to make it more stable. Now, of course, the actual reason 
for the invasion of Iraq has nothing to do with democracy. It has nothing, nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, which were not there and which haven't been found. And uh, we knew at the time already that Saddam Hussein had no weapons of mass destruction because before the invasion, the uh, UN said so already. And uh, w later on, it was revealed that intelligence uh, services in, uh, in the Netherlands, in the UK, as well as in the United States, knew that Saddam Hussein had no weapons of mass destruction. To give you one example, the, uh, at the time, head of MI6, the UK intelligence uh, service, um, was revealed to have said that the facts and intelligence, I'm quoting now, the facts and intelligence were fixed around the policy around the policy of invading Iraq. Um, yeah. And the reason for the invasion is also not democracy. We know that Saddam Hussein, as I have explained uh, throughout the 80s, to be, to, for example, was supported militarily and otherwise by the West. In fact, um, a top member of Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath party said that Saddam Hussein reached power on an American train uh, Saddam Hussein, for example, received lists from the CIA with names of his political opponents uh, so he could go ahead and take care of them. Um, in the late 1950s, uh, Saddam Hussein's party, the Ba'ath Party, had about 3,000 members. That's it. It had no popular base in Iraq whatsoever. Um, very soon thereafter, however, the party took over uh, uh, in Iraq, uh, took power in Iraq, and then Saddam Hussein using the vehicle of that party took over. And this takeover probably would not have been possible without substantial Western support. And one of the reasons for that Western support of, at the time, besides the oil, which I'll get to in a bit, was a very strong left movement uh, in Iraq. In 1958, for example, the Iraqi Communist Party was the largest communist party outside of the officially communist world um, and um, the number of members is estimated at about one million. Um, at the time, like I said, the Ba'ath Party had only 3,000 members. Oh, wow. But from the perspective of empire, it is not democracy that matters, but it is pursuing your interests that matter. And so that small party of 3,000 members was supported by, amongst others, the United States, which enabled it to take power later on. Uh, now, as I said, oil is the key to understanding Western policies in the Middle East. And um, this is something we know from internal documents. So, for example, in the early 40s, but you can find other documents as well. Um, uh, in the 40s, it was uh, uh, decided by the United States government um, that the Middle East oil should be considered a stupendous source of strategic power, I'm quoting now, and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. Um, and given the United States' ambition to be the single superpower in the world, it had to ensure control over that stupendous source of strategic power, Middle Eastern oil. And since that time, at least, oil has been the primary concern for American as well as British or Dutch policies uh, in the Middle East. Um, so Saudi Arabia is a Western ally, has been for a very long time, since the 50s at least. And um, that country is under control. In the same time, we know that Saudi Arabia is probably one of the most dictatorial retarded medieval uh, regimes in the world where hands are cut off uh, when you are when you are found to be stealing uh, where women are not allowed to drive where um, uh, there is not even the semblance of democracy you know they don't they don't even have elections they don't they don't do that that kind of thing but you never hear any american president complaining about that you also don't hear any american president complaining about the support that the saudi government gives to all kinds of uh, religious um, extremist movements all over the world. Uh, why? Well, you only complain about democracy, weapons of mass destruction and terrorism if the country in question is not under your control yet. Saudi Arabia is under American control, so we don't talk about it. Iraq, however, at the time of the Iraq war, was not entirely under control yet, and therefore the Iraqi oil supply was not entirely under American control. 
And therefore, all kinds of excuses had to be made up about why uh, the invasion of that country was justified. Um, I, I can't help but wonder, was the, <clears throat> was the execution of Saddam Hussein necessary? What was the reason behind all of that, besides a PR? Honestly, I, I, from the American perspective, I wouldn't know what else beside PR. <laughs> um, I mean, like I said, this is, um, how should I say this? Your audience is a friendly audience, so um, everything I'm saying now is something that is commonsensical yeah, to them. Yeah. We're all nodding our head, yes, in agreement. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but if you understand how world politics works, if you, for example, take into account that the U.S. government um, is the same government that, well, let me just take an example, that decided to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki even though they knew the Japanese uh, empire had already surrendered um, uh, uh, from, by the way, um, a research that was conducted by the American government, I think, in fact, the Pentagon, um, using about 700 Japanese informants, you know, prisoners of war and others, um, to which the U.S. had access after Japan was defeated. Based on that research, the government concluded that the atomic bombs were not necessary to make Japan surrender. In fact, not even an invasion using regular weaponry was necessary to make Japan surrender because Japan had already surrendered by that time. Nonetheless, the American government decided to drop those atomic bombs, killing immediately 200,000 people. Uh, the number of victims afterwards is, uh, you know, continues to rise until today because of the radiation. This is the United States government we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It is the same government that supports the Saudi regime. It is the same government that has supported Saddam Hussein's regime. It is the same government that imposed a brutal sanctions regime on Iraq throughout the 90s, as a result of which, according to UNICEF, 500,000 Iraqi children have died in the 90s. Um, it is also the same government that invades one country after another under the pretext of bringing democracy and fighting terrorism in order to impose all kinds of puppet regimes that will do the U.S. bidding. If you take all of this into account and you ask the question, well, why did they kill Saddam Hussein? Then really there can't be any other answer but, well, it must be some sort of PR. Um, it looked quite good um, uh, for the United States to be able to say, you know, we promised that we would get rid of Saddam Hussein and now we did. Well, if that is your real concern, why did you bring Saddam Hussein to power in yeah. the first place? And, and unfortunately, a majority of Americans don't even realize that fact that we were the ones who installed him, funded him and gave him, uh, gave him all the power to do what we later decided we didn't like. Um, yeah. And, 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 and if I can, to kind of expand uh, on the Saddam Hussein PR mentality of the Western uh, media and or the American media, uh, one of the, one of the um, issues, of course, was 9-11, and uh, we believe that it was al-Qaeda, and then al-Qaeda uh, was in Iraq, and Saddam Hussein was a part of al-Qaeda. We, of course, figured out later on he had nothing to do with al-Qaeda um, what is the, what is your perception of the Al Qaeda false or real threat uh, during the beginnings of the Iraq War? Well, we knew at the time uh, simply by using common sense that Saddam, that whatever reason the U.S. would publicly use to invade Iraq, it would be false pretexts, nothing else. Um, uh, so we knew at the time, even without further researching it, just based on common sense, that Saddam Hussein, um, that, that Iraq would not be invaded because Saddam Hussein has something to do with Al-Qaeda. Uh, since it has been very well established that Saddam Hussein had no connections to Al-Qaeda whatsoever. And of course, making that connection is again a matter of PR. At some point, 80% of the American soldiers in Iraq believed that they were there because of 9-11. Yeah. And this is very important. You don't send people to a country they probably have 
you know, know nothing about in order to risk their lives and die if you can't tell them that they're doing it for a higher cause. And therefore, you need this propaganda to the general public as well as to the soldiers that you are uh, sending to Iraq or other places. Um, because this will justify for those soldiers not only the sacrifice that they themselves have to bring um, uh, in terms of you know risking their own death, uh, seeing their comrades die, uh, but it will also justify for those soldiers the thousands of deaths, in fact, by now in Iraq, hundreds of thousands, uh, 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 of, of uh, Iraqi civilians, um, you will be less likely willing to shoot at people if you don't have in the back of your head a higher reason for doing it. And that higher reason is readily provided when you can make these soldiers believe, well, we're here for 9-11. We're here to protect the American uh, uh, way of life and the American freedom. Um, but even if say, Saddam Hussein had something to do with, uh, with 9-11. Let us assume for a moment that this is the case. Uh, would a war then be the right answer? Uh, a war which has now, according to uh, uh, the most recent peer-reviewed uh, survey, uh, uh, resulted in the killing of up to 500,000 Iraqis. So since 2003, 500,000 Iraqis have died as a result of the war. Um, would it be justified to have a war like this because of 9-11? And the answer must be no, for two reasons. At least, one, proportionality. Yeah. You don't kill half a million of people because of uh, uh, an attack on your country. Um, one. Two, um, a war like that doesn't reduce terror. Uh, if you want to reduce terror, the first thing you should do is to be not a terrorist yourself. And the United States um, is, if you look at the number of victims that it makes, uh, arguably the greatest terror that at this moment is present. And when I say the United States, I don't mean American people. I mean the American government and mm -hmm. the corporations mm -hmm. uh, 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 that are supported by that government. So take, for example, to stick to the Iraq case, the military strategy that the United States has applied in Iraq, as well as elsewhere, by the way, even in Vietnam, uh, uh, the same strategy has been applied, but it wasn't, um, it, it didn't have a, a clear name at the time. The strategy uh, uh, is called the shock and awe strategy. Yep. Uh, and probably you've heard of this. Uh, Naomi Klein, for example, uh, made this very well known to the public. I'm yeah. afraid this is the case. And the point of that strategy was to use spectacular, I'm using the word from the official Pentagon documents, spectacular force um, against not only the military targets in your adversary's country, but also against the civilian population. And thus the uh, uh, official Pentagon documents that describe that strategy um, uh, describe how water sanitation facilities must be attacked how food supply facilities and electricity supply and, and civilian communication facilities must be attacked. And the goal is to make sure that not only the adversary is militarily defeated, but that after defeat, the population can be controlled. Because the point is not only to get rid of Saddam Hussein in the case of Iraq, but also to redesign Iraqi society such that it will fit American interests for example, imposing a neoliberal regime, which requires that ordinary people who are the first victims of such economic policies will not rise to their feet and attempt an uprising against your new, uh, uh, the new regime that you impose as an imperial force in Iraq. Um, and interestingly, uh, Rumsfeld at the time, um, when he was talking about the uh, shock and awe strategy, he said, uh, and I'm quoting him, um, it was a way for us to get people to do what we wanted them to do and stop doing what we did not want them to do, um, which very clearly shows that the shock and awe strategy was a way to make people do what you want them to do out of fear. In other words, words terrorize them into submission. 
um, if any other government in the world would, and which is not an ally of the U.S., would uh, uh, say such things like Rumsfeld was saying, it would immediately be considered to be terror. But when Absolutely. the United States does it, well, it's it's not terror. It's you know we're fighting for democracy or whatever other nonsense they make up. That's very very true. And uh, if I can expand a little bit on that. Uh, Beside um, the shock and awe of uh, motivating people through fear, through war, let's say what's happening here in the Middle East, uh, we have that happening here through media. Uh, our media has got people crippled with fear uh, with these um, these newscasts of, you know, the, the terrorists are around the corner. I don't know if you know anything about what happened here last year. We had a, a bombing in Boston, and they imposed a police state on the city of Boston. And allowing, allowing the, uh, I believe, I don't know if it was the police or the National Guard to search everyone's home in Boston without a warrant. Yeah. This was in the United right. States, the land of the so-called free. And, uh, it, and, and I wonder, and, 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 and this is, a, I guess, a philosophical or metaphysical question that I'm asking here at this point, maybe not so much political, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Um, we talk about... Uh, the United States um, uh, and the corporations being the puppets for the United States. Uh, here, we're having a little bit of a different perception that the United States government has become a puppet of the, cor the uh, multinational corporations. And we are basically there. Well, not we, the people, but the government itself has become the, um, the guardian and or the strong arm of the multicorporational um, uh, agenda. I think this is not very far off the mark. Uh, it, it definitely is the case that the U.S. government does not act on behalf of the average American in virtually all of its policies, nor does it act uh, uh, in for the sake of the national interest. Um, it acts on behalf of a very small number of people who are sufficiently powerful in order to make sure that the government uh, acts uh, in their interest. And this too is um, uh, apparent from the internal documents of governments, including the United States. To, to give you one example from the top of my, uh, uh, my mind, um, in, I believe, 1975, maybe 1976, mid-70s, the uh, U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations identified the interest of American firms as uh, 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 virtually equal to the national interest. And it also identified U.S. firms to be not only tools of foreign policy, but also to be the objective of foreign policy. So again, the interest of these corporations are what is behind U.S. foreign policy. And the same thing applies for domestic policies. Look, for example, at the way wealth is distributed in the United States. Um, according to statistics from before the crisis, um, so now the picture is probably more grim, before the crisis already, 60% of the working population of the United States lived below the poverty line. Now, the poverty line, as I define it, and as defined by those statistics, is not the official poverty line of the United States, which is um, uh, not a decent one, but it is a poverty line that includes, at a minimum, the ability to feed yourself, dress yourself, afford decent housing as well as de decent health care. These basic things that are not unreasonable to expect to be available for a citizen in the most powerful country and the wealthiest country in the world. If you take that into account, then 60% of the American working people, so not the jobless people, live below the poverty line. In the same time, I don't need to tell you that a very small a number of people in the United States have wealth that is so grotesquely large um, that you must ask yourself uh, uh, um, how on earth could such a thing occur without some sort of enormous uprising breaking yeah. out. Yeah. 
And we're still waiting. <laughs> you know, we see, you know, here in the United States, especially myself, who I, I, as an activist, uh, a spiritual activist, but yet an activist, uh, it, it's very frustrating. Anyway, uh, we have to take a break, and we'll be right back after this commercial message. And now, back to your host, Bernard Alvarez. Welcome back to the Just Bernard Show here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. You are listening to the Just Bernard Show live. We were speaking with Ali Al-Jabir about the truth of the Iraq war. Um, welcome back, Ali. I, during the break, I was uh, looking through the chat, and someone posted a very interesting article, and I can't help but see... The same thing happening again right now. Uh, the article is uh, son of U.S. Vice President Biden joins Ukraine gas company. The youngest son of Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, has been appointed <laughs> head of legal affairs at Ukraine's largest private gas producer. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> predictable, isn't it? <laughs> very, very predictable and very sad, unfortunately. Um, I, 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 I would like to um, I, I'd like to ask you, Ali, what, to, to the best of your knowledge, how is life now on the ground in Iraq? Supposedly the troops are gone. Um, I, I know they're not. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of your understanding of what life is like today? Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think one of the largest uh, U.S. military bases is still there. Well, no, the, the largest U.S. embassy in the world is oh. in Iraq. Um, officially, there are no U.S. military bases uh, in Iraq. Um, however, we also know that governments act in secrecy when it comes to military affairs, so we are not sure about it. But even if um, we, we would assume that official information is right and there is no U.S. military presence in Iraq besides what is necessary to quote-unquote protect the U.S. embassy in Baghdad, um, the U.S. military is never gone out of the Middle East. Uh, some of the largest U.S. bases uh, in the world are still in the Middle East, they're outside of Iraq, but they're there. If need be, the U.S. can be in Iraq in a, you know, in a few minutes with substantial military force. Um, and you should also keep in mind that indirectly the U.S. military is present in Iraq because the Iraqi government, to a large extent, is acting on behalf of the U.S. government and the corporations um, uh, that have a vested interest in that, in that government, and it is using U.S. weapons. So, for example, recently, uh, which brings me to, to answering your question about what is life in Iraq now, um, recently uh, the Maliki government of Iraq received advanced weapons from the United States, in order to crush the uh, armed uh, uprising in the west of Iraq. Um, uh, some time ago, uh, peaceful protests were staged in uh, Al Anbar, which is uh, a large province in Iraq in the west. And uh, that protest was, uh, according to Human Rights Watch as well as other organizations, peaceful. It formed no security threat whatsoever. But because it opposed the government and was making rightful demands for democracy and better services and redistribution of income, that protest had to be taken care of by the government of Iraq. And it was brutally crushed. Several uh, dozens of people uh, uh, were killed in, that, in the process, as a result of which the matter escalated and the situation has gone um, uh, quite out of control uh, large sections of uh, the Iraq, Iraqi western provinces are now no longer under the control of the government of Iraq. Uh, they are contested between the Iraqi government and armed groups, in, uh, according, uh, including um, uh, supposedly Al-Qaeda-related groups. Um, and on average, since uh, January this year, 1,000 Iraqis uh, have died as a result of the escalation of violence in Iraq. Um, and this reading uh, of the Iraqi government being the primary responsible actor for the escalation of the violence is not just mine. You can also find it in quite mainstream uh, think tanks uh, writing. 
including the International Crisis Group, who come to approximately the same conclusion as I come to now. Uh, and that group is financed, amongst others, by the uh, uh, U.S. Um, uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, life in Iraq, uh, you know, it, it depends on who you are and where you are. Some areas in Iraq are, are safer than others. So the western part of Iraq is now quite in an explosive situation. Baghdad has always been an explosive area. The north of Iraq, where the majority is, uh, uh, are the Kurds, is relatively safe compared to other places. Um, in terms of uh, um, poverty, uh, the situation in Iraq is quite bad. The majority of the population in Iraq uh, suffers from enormous poverty. Uh, the provision of electricity, uh, safe drinking water um, is lamentable, has hardly improved uh, uh, um, since the invasion. In fact, the levels of electricity and water provision are no way near the levels of pre-Gulf War Iraq, which I think should be the, uh, the standard to use. Yeah. Um, in the same time, however, those who are associated with the new Iraqi political economic elite brought to power by the United States and their allies are pretty well off. Uh, they receive great salaries, have great access to government resources as well as other resources. Um, using, amongst others, corruption. Uh, they have been able to acquire some of the public firms in Iraq, which were privatized by the Americans immediately after the invasion and were bought by multinational corporations and the local political economic elite that was supportive of the, uh, the invasion. So this is roughly the situation uh, in Iraq. I heard a joke uh, which sort of summarizes all of this um, from the perspective of an ordinary Iraqi, and the joke is as follows, um, uh, an uneducated uh, old uh, Iraqi man was complaining about uh, democracy. He said that he didn't like democracy, and so he was asked, but do you know what democracy is? Um, and he answered, yes, I know what democracy is. Democracy means there are no jobs, no running water, no electricity, and the president comes from the United States. <laughs> this is, I think, a very uh, poignant uh, uh, summary of the situation in Iraq for the average Iraqi. Uh, democracy in Iraq is a facade to hide all of, uh, all of the terror and the poverty uh, and the filthy political games that the average Iraqi is subjected to. I can't help but um, feel, uh, or my my perception and observation of the entire invasion of Iraq was literally to to rape and pillage the the entire system, economy, land, resources, government. Um, it, it really is that a fair a fair estimate to just uh, come in and take everything and make it ours. Uh, yeah, um, in you know to the. To, the pers to someone who has been indoctrinated with uh, Western-style education and media, what you are saying now is outrageous. Uh, it makes you some sort of conspiracy thing. Right, right. <laughs> some sort of communist, you know, this is... But if you really look at the facts, then you have to conclude that what you just said is simply commonsensical and right. And the, over Bernard, the overwhelming majority of the world population... Um, uh, believes what you just said uh, because they live in the so-called third world and they are yes. subjected to perpetual war and rape and pillage so they don't really need to sit and argue about nitty-gritty details of what the United States was actually doing whether or not they were trying to bring democracy but then they failed uh, unintentionally etc. They know that in a world that is dominated by an imperial force as powerful as the United States, uh, foreign policy means the best way from the perspective of the imperialist to gain access to countries and take what you can take. Uh, there is in fact a very, um, let me just look it up. Um, uh, it, released high-level U.S. government documents, and I, I like to base what I say on internal, doc, internal documentation, 
Um, so no one can argue, you know, you're making this up. Mm -hmm. uh, but the United States considers a, a threat to its interests, and now I'll quote, radical, and when they say radical, they mean democratic, uh, radical and nationalistic regimes aiming at immediate improvement in the low living standards of the masses, which conflicts with a political and economic climate conductive to private investment and the protection of our raw materials. Now, our raw materials is what is written in the original U.S. government document. And they are referring to raw materials in Latin America, but this could apply all to, to Iraq as well. And you have to understand imperial logic in order to understand why a U.S. government official would pen down to paper the words our raw materials in reference to raw materials present in other people's countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you see this, um, then uh, uh, you have to realize that what you said, the point of the Iraq war, as well as at any other invasion, is to rape and pillage and take whatever you can take, is really as accurate as you can be. I can't help but uh, it reminds me a little bit of the, um, how shall I say, the the mentality of the middle age uh, middle ages the mentality within the middle ages of the monarch the monarch was you know uh you know divinely inspired by god and by divine right had the right to own people own land own resources and whatnot and it, we seem to be seeing it spill over into the modern imperialistic idea of of what the united states quote unquote government is now um, I, I I have a, a comment here that was posted during the show, and I'm wondering uh, what your response to this would be. Um, they were saying that the reasons for the Iraq war, war are to steal oil, kill Saddam Hussein, and promote Israeli dominance over the Middle East. But most importantly, to destroy historical, factual documents, records, and artifacts that were held by the Iraqis since Mesopotamia. That's uh, very interesting. I understand where that uh, point of view comes from. Um, immediately after the invasion, uh, uh, looting occurred in, in, in Iraq, uh, not on a, a scale as large as you would expect in the chaos of war, but on a large scale nonetheless. One of the places that received most attention because of its looting was the Iraqi National Museum in the center of Baghdad. And that museum holds some of the most valuable historic and archaeological artifacts of mankind. It's not a, an Iraqi uh, matter. It's a matter for all humanity. Right, right. Um, and uh, uh, in a nick of time, thousands of art artifacts were taken and were sold uh, reportedly, in fact, within 24 hours after the first looting of the National Museum. Artifacts were found in Paris uh, coming from that museum. I, I haven't verified this, but it's, it's been reported. Mm -hmm. um, and I therefore understand why one would have the impression that the aim of the war was to loot that museum. But wars as large as the Iraq war are never organized for such a purpose. Uh, the reason is to gain access to the economy of Iraq, most importantly to Iraqi oil. And we can expand on that in a bit, which can also be illustrated with the looting that occurred in ba Baghdad. Uh, about a 10 minutes drive from the Iraqi National Museum is located the Iraqi Ministry of Oil. Now the Ministry of Oil was left untouched by looters. Why? Because it was protected around the clock by American Marines. Mm. They made sure that no one would touch it. They also made sure, the American uh, army as well as its allies, that Iraqi oil fields were left untouched by quote-unquote terrorist or insurgent groups. Um, and Amnesty International at the time, which is interesting because Amnesty International is quite a mainstream organization, they don't say things that may be considered radical in the mainstream. Right. But even Amnesty International at the time had to admit and criticize the U.S. government for not investing in the safety of Iraqis and investing much more in securing oil resources. And this shows us what the real purpose was for the Iraq oil. 
for the Iraq war. Uh, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm using Iraq war and oil almost as a, a synonym. So right, interchangeable, absolutely. <laughs> and that has a reason. Uh, and we know the purpose was primarily oil. Um, we know from a commonsensical point of view, as I told you, that if a country aspires to being the dominant force in the world, then it must have control, not just access, but control of global oil supplies. Um, and the United States is a government of that kind of uh, aspiration. Um, in the case of Iraq, we know, again, from uh, uh, what American officials and uh, uh, U.S. government documentation tell us that the purpose was primarily oil. General Abizaid, um, who was uh, head of Central Command, which was responsible for uh, most of the military operations of the United States in Iraq, and Central Command is also explicitly tasked with securing oil flow flows from the Middle East, General Abizaid said, uh, the Iraq war was about, of course, the Iraq war was about oil. We can't really deny that. So he's admitting it. Uh, another person who wrote about this was uh, Bernanke in his memoirs. He admitted that although it is politically inconvenient to admit such thing, the Iraq war was largely about oil. We also know that right about two years before the invasion, uh, under the leadership of Dick Cheney, the U.S. government set up uh, an organ which brought together the U.S. government with um, the large oil companies, including uh, 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 Chevron, uh, British Petroleum, and Shell, uh, in order to uh, basically plan the Iraq invasion. They discussed Iraq's total oil reserves. They reviewed lists and maps of Iraq's uh, oil wealth. And guess what companies are now exploiting Iraqi oil? Well, exactly those companies, uh, Shell, British Petroleum, uh, 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 Chevron, and other uh, major Western oil companies. Uh, and they are doing so under very lucrative conditions. You have to realize that the Iraqi people, according to surveys, are opposed to neoliberal economics. They are opposed to their oil being sold and exploited under conditions of free market economics and they yeah. prefer the nationalization of Iraqi oil. But the reality is that Iraqi oil is all but privatized as far as possible within the, uh, uh, the current situation. Uh, and this also explains why it is impossible for an imperial war to be fought for democracy. If the aim is to gain control of Iraqi oil, then by definition, you must oppose democracy because the Iraqi people don't want the United States to control oil. They want their oil to be nationalized and to be controlled by a democratically elected Iraqi government, which is not the case. Right. Uh, one final point on this. In, uh, uh, in 2007, uh, I believe the uh, coalitions so of the UK and, and the United States, etc., presented the Iraqi government with a new oil law. And that oil law would all but privatize Iraqi oil. And privatization means that it can be owned by multinational corporations. Um, and the Iraqi parliament at the time was even more than now probably in the pocket of the United States because they were elected under U.S. military uh, occupation. And uh, the U.S. government was the most powerful actor in town. You know, they had the, the, the uh, final say because they controlled uh, 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 the means of violence. Um, nonetheless, the Iraqi parliament refused to accept that corporate drafted law. The law was, amongst others, by the way, drafted by a Dutch uh, consultancy. And the reason they did so was because the Iraqi people opposed that law. Uh, since Iraqi uh, unions had noticed the law and organized popular opposition against it. And the opposition was so large that the Iraqi parliament, despite being in the pockets of the United States, refused to accept the law. Nonetheless, Iraqi oil is now being exploited under conditions that, were, that resemble the conditions stipulated in that law, without that law being accepted by parliament. So there is no legal base hmm. for export of Iraqi oil. In other words, there is no democratic base for the export of Iraqi oil, right. and technically the export of Iraqi oil now is illegal. Nonetheless, it is happening, 
because this was the point to begin with, right? Not to uh, destroy Iraqi national heritage, although this has been the necessary outcome of the war, but the point was to have control over oil and other important economic uh, re resources. And of course, doing it above the law, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, uh, and even if they, they, you know, they do things within the law, who makes the law in Iraq now? Well, it must be the Iraqi government, right? right? What is the Iraqi government? Does it represent the Iraqi people? The answer must be no. I'll just give you a few illustrations that anyone should be yeah. willing to agree with. Uh, the national elections of 2010 in Iraq witnessed a turnout of 50% roughly. Only 50% of the people voted. Wow. Now, why did they do that? Because they're too lazy, because they don't believe in democracy, because they don't care about their future, because they're depoliticized? Well, of course not. The reason is that they don't trust that the government will act on their behalf. They live under the realities of imperialism and a puppet regime controlled by an empire. Although they might not be able to articulate all these things the way I am doing now, because I've had the privilege of having a lot of time to read about these things, they realize all of these matters because it is a daily reality to them. And therefore, 50% of the Iraqis roughly decided not to vote. In the current, uh, the most recent elections, uh, the 30th of April of this year, there were elections in Iraq again. Um, major sections of the Iraqi territory, as I explained, in the West, are not under the control of the Iraqi government, as a result of which no elections could be uh, organized there. And in the Anbar province, which is the largest province in Iraq, or only 30% approximately of the people were able to vote. So if not even, uh, you know, the technicalities of elections um, represent some sort of democracy, how can we speak of uh, a democracy in Iraq uh, and of the laws of Iraq representing the will of the Iraqi people? It's a, it, it, and I hate to say, as much as I am uh, cons uh, disconcerted about that situation in Iraq, the same thing is happening in the United States. They have literally, uh, and it's not because, again, people aren't active or, or lazy. We're seeing more and more people getting politically active here. Unfortunately, the laws have become so restrictive as to who can vote and who you can vote for. Uh, just recently, a Gallup poll. Uh, showed here in the United States that over 42% of Americans do not consider themselves Democratic or Republican. However, according to election rules, you cannot vote in a primary unless you are aligned with a particular political party. So it just seems like this is an ongoing situation. And again, you know, I'd like to make the case for this during the last part of the show because – for me, it is about imperialism. It is about um, the corporations ruling the countries. I, I, I can't help but think uh, eventually what is going to happen when the powers that be, the ones who, who are manipulating the United States to the, manipulating the United States government to impose this police state uh, type of, uh, uh, well, country. We're, we're turning into a police state here, which is very strange for us, the land of the free. What's going to happen to the United States when the multinational corporations and the global elite, like the oil companies, decide that they no longer have use for us? Are they going to throw us under the bus as well? Huh. You know? Um, yeah. <laughs> the, thing is, the thing is, they whenever, um, whenever a population is meaningless from the perspective of the powerful, be it now or in the Middle Ages, this is just the logic of power when it is concentrated in a few hands and people have no say over the fundamentals of their lives. Whenever there is no use for a population, the population will be disposed of. Um, so the Ira half a million Iraqi children dying in uh, Iraq as a result of the sanctions imposed by the United States, obviously these kids are disposable from the perspective of empire and the U.S. government. In fact, uh, Madeleine Albright, who was in the 90s the U.S. Secretary of State, was asked on 60 Minutes, um, was asked, uh, have, we, have, we know, she was told, 
that according to UNICEF, half a million Iraqi children have died as a result of the sanctions. Do you think this was worth it? I'm quoting. Do you think this was worth it? And Madeleine Albright replied, quote, yes, I think this was worth it. Uh, worth it for what? For democracy? Obviously, we have no democracy. It was worth it because multinational corporations and whoever supports them and is gaining from the U.S. policies in Iraq uh, considered it worth it that they gain a few billion dollars in exchange for the blood of Iraqi children. You mu we must, however, also realize that the system only functions because we allow it to function, yeah. because we go to our work, because we pay taxes, because we are willing to serve in the army. Immediately when we stop doing these things, the system will respond, and it will respond very violently, and there will be many casualties. But the system will not be able to function forever mm -hmm. if we become uh, uh, we apply for what is called civil disobedience. Right. Yeah. I call it non-compliance. Yeah. Non-compliance, and it's very important from the perspective of the of status quo institutions that people do not realize this, because when they realize that, they might actually engage in some serious political uh, activism uh, on a mass scale. And this is the reason why, for example, in the United States, but also in the Netherlands, the very rich, and I would say uh, in terms of uh, a gain for civilization, glorious history of the labor movements is left out, as a result of which children in the U.S. do not realize that some of their most important rights are the direct result of people standing on their feet, demanding their rights, yep. uh, going on strike. And they will more likely, American kids in this case, think, well, we have these rights because the president is such a great person or because the government is taking care of us. Or they simply will have no idea about the fact that these rights did not fall out of the sky, but people fought for them. And by extension, that if they want to have rights now, that they also have to fight for them. Um, and this is something I think activists should be stressing, that we have a significant part of the power and we shouldn't let our political apathy that is imposed on us by media and corporations and the governments, we shouldn't let that political apathy make us forget this historic reality. And it, and it seems as if, at least here in the United States, that they are doing their best to bury that. Uh, I mean, labor, labor unions, labor movements are looked at as communistic, anti-American, and meanwhile... The labor unions and labor movement really started in the United States. They don't, or May Day even, the May Day celebration started in the United States. They don't even realize that. They've mm -hmm. forgotten that. And the media does such a great job at uh, you know, making it look like it's a bad thing. You, you have a 40-hour work week because of the labor unions. You, your kids don't have to go to work at 7 because of the labor union. You have a minimum wage, even though that's nothing right now, because of the labor union. <laughs> Anyway, and we can talk about that when we come back. We've got to take a break, and when we return, we're going to finish up this wonderful discussion uh, about the realities of the Iraq War and, of course, about imperialism when we return with Ali al-Jabir. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Just Bernard Show here on Revolution Radio. And now, back to your host, Bernard Alvarez. And welcome back to the Just Bernard Show here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We are having a wonderful discussion today with Ali Al-Jabir about the truth of the Iraq War. Uh, before we get back into the conversation, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update. Of course, I wanted to remind you that if you want more information about myself, this show, or the work that I am doing um, with the Global Illumination Council... Uh, please go ahead and go on over to thegic.org. Uh, that is our main website and a membership uh, social um, network. Uh, feel free to become a member. We only ask for you to donate at least $1.95 a month if you would like to be a member. Uh, we have members from all over the world, all different types of groups. Uh, and, of course, um, all the work that I've been doing over the last eight years is there. Free classes, free shows etc., etc., as well 
Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Uh, we have a pretty large Facebook um, page with over 300,000 fans at facebook.com slash global illumination council. That'll keep you updated uh, with the latest shows, the latest topics that we're discussing, and you can jump uh, into the discussion as well on our global illumination council Facebook group. Uh, next week, I want to let you know and remind you that we are having Jeff Harvey will be returning to the just Bernard show again, alternative healer, uh, amazing man. He was, uh, believe it or not, he was uh, working for the U.S. military at one point uh, doing special ops for the Navy, uh, Navy intelligence. And uh, when he left, uh, he went into trying to uh, to help people. And, and his main focus now is to use the intelligence that he gained in technology as well as other uh, types of black operations into healing people using different devices and different types of methodology. Uh, so you can find him next week here on the Just Bernard Show on Revolution Radio. And then, of course, on uh, May 27th, I can't believe it's only two weeks away again, uh, I will be doing my monthly consciousness talk. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, finding your mission in life and, and how to really act on that. Are you, uh, what is your, your true calling in life? And, and, and it goes great with what we were talking about earlier about noncompliance, because eventually to find your true calling, you have to move into that noncompliance mentality of I am not going to be a, a slave for the corporations. I'm going to do what I need to do here on this planet in order to A, be happy, and B, make this a better world for everybody. So that'll be on May 27th, the, uh, the monthly consciousness talk uh, by myself. Uh, anyway, um, of course, let me bring back Ali Al-Jabir. Welcome back, Ali. Um, I, I need to ask you, because there's been so much speculation, especially in the activist movement. I mean, uh, right now, finally, finally, after years and years of, uh, for lack of a better term, of apartheid in Palestine, uh, people are standing up against Israel. We were never allowed to say anything negative about Israel in the United States. And still, to an extent, uh, many people are afraid, and of course the government uh, will never, uh, well, hopefully will soon, but has not have the, uh, the bravery uh, to say anything very negative about Israel and what they're doing with the Palestinians. Uh, what is... Um, in, in your perception or throughout uh, the documentation that you've read, uh, what role did Israel play in anything dealing with the Iraq war? Is it just speculation uh, by those who are angry with Israel, or did they literally have some type of um, influence on the United States uh, invading? Well, we know, and, and evidence is, is overwhelming uh, on this matter, that Israel is quite important to the United States. And that probably any action that the United States will undertake in the uh, Middle East um, uh, will only be taken after considering the interest of Israel. Uh, and to an extent, the interests of Israel are in line with the interests of the United States. But there's also good evidence to suggest that Sometimes the United States acts in accordance with Israeli interests, which violates U.S. Uh, imperial interests, in yeah. fact. Yeah. Uh, and this is, of course, the result of uh, uh, the great influence that the pro-Israel lobby in the United States uh, has over the government. Um, the details in the case of Iraq, unfortunately, I did not study, but I'm sure if you would try hard, you will find uh, some interesting evidence. It is important, however that uh, we as activists are careful in the, in the conclusions that we draw. Um, our uh, contempt for the oppression that the Israeli government uh, practices against the Palestinians and by extension people of the region should not blind us into uncritically accepting all kinds of uh, 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 ideas about the unlimited power of Israel on the United States and on the Middle East. The power of Israel is not unlimited um, and Israel certainly doesn't decide everything. Uh, it is, of, however, nonetheless a very important matter to always consider when thinking about U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. 
Um, an interesting a classic, of course, that you should read is uh, Noam Chomsky's Fateful Triangle. Um, uh, Chomsky is uh, a good source uh, in any case, but in, in, in this uh, particular case, uh, his seminal work, The Fateful Triangle, is definitely sh- something you should read. Oh, very. I've never heard of that title before. I'm going to have to look into that one, definitely. One of my favorite uh, writers, of course, and uh, an activist, actually. <laughs> he was the, the one who brought me to the place of aligning myself with, um, what is it, socialist libertarianism. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I guess that's the best thing to describe of, um, the best way to describe of how I feel uh, politically, that, uh, you know, governments should be small, but uh, we should also be fair and equal. Um, anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about American imperialism in the grander scale. Uh, you know, Iraq is definitely, uh, uh, I don't know if, I don't want to say it was the beginning, but it, in this era, it was the, what brought us into the era of, as, as we call, near, neoliberal, neoliberalism and or neoconservatism. It started off as neoconservatism and moved into neoliberalism, but um, we're seeing so much action going on in the region uh, between, uh, well, Afghanistan, of course. Uh, I, I don't know much about the details with Afghanistan. The news here really doesn't say much. Uh, well, then again, I'm on a media fast. I can't watch corporate media anymore. But um, I will say that uh, dealing with in, in alternative and independent media, what I've seen is we're seeing uh, a lot of stuff going on with the United States and Syria, like you said. Um, and so much uh, in the region, and it's very confusing, even for an activist here. Um, A good example is the Egyptian Arab Spring. Uh, Here, I I have friends on the ground there. They let me know what's going on, and they're like, yes, yes, you know, the Arab Spring is great. The first one was great, it's great, it's great. Uh, Then they decide they didn't like uh, the, the president. Uh, that was brought in. Now the military's uh, installed, and they're not happy with the military. What is the the real situation going on in all of these? Uh, do you feel that the American imperialistic movement uh, is uh, has its tentacles in all of these um, uprisings? Um, again, we we must qualify what, what what we mean with to have tentacles in all these uh, movements. Do you feel it's there? It is. Uh, is it, it their motivation to install a puppet regime? Is a is a good way of saying it. Look, the 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 interest of the U.S. at all times in crucial areas is to have the right regime there that guarantees U.S. interests, and the United States and its allies have a very long history in invading countries and imposing the regimes of their liking. Take, for example, the Vietnam War. Um, the uh, Diem government was a creation of the United States. And uh, we know this from uh, the Pentagon files, which were leaked at the time um, uh, by someone working for the Pentagon, uh, and which described the Diem government as a government with no support of the Vietnamese and which depended entirely on American support. Uh, for example, the United States invaded the Dominican Republic in 1965 and imposed its own regime there. Grenada was invaded in 1983, Panama 1989, uh, Haiti was invaded in 1915 and was occupied until 1930, uh, the 1930s. Um, uh, regime change was applied in Haiti uh, in 1991 when Aristide was elected uh, by the people. Uh, He was the first and only genuinely democratically elected president in Haiti and against all the odds um, uh, he he was elected because ordinary people in the slums and in the most marginalized areas of Haiti organized themselves. But he was not to the liking of the U.S., uh, who were not expecting him to win, and therefore um, a, a coup was organized, supported by the U.S., uh, and in 1994, uh, Aristide was allowed to return to Haiti, but the condition was that he accepts basically the entire economic agenda of uh, the candidate that he had defeated in 1991. Um, so, uh, imperialism of the United States did not start nor end uh, with Iraq. Uh, As you rightly point out, Iraq is just another case, uh, um, uh, a very important case, but it is not the only one. Um, As to the 
uh, so-called Arab Spring. Um, and I, I don't like, let me start by saying that I don't like that term. Uh, as far as I know, this term was not coined by the people who organized the Arab Spring. These are, you know, ordinary people uh, uh, who decided that enough is enough and, and we should uh, we should change uh, our lives. Uh, and it implies that the Arab world was in a long sleep, uh, in a long uh, sleepy winter, yeah. uh, accepting dictatorship, etc., and that suddenly they woke up and decided, hey, you know what? Let's try and now organize some sort of democracy. This is not the case. The movements that we have witnessed in the Arab world certainly experienced an unprecedented momentum the past few years. But they were only possible because uh, numerous people for a very long time have been organizing themselves and attempting some sort of change, uh, agitating the population, for example. Right. In Egypt, uh, we are very often made uh, uh, not told that before the masses marched to Tahrir Square in Cairo that we saw on CNN and other channels because it was unavoidable, uh, uh, over 3,000 uh, uh, labor strikes uh, were witnessed in Egypt in the five years preceding that mass, uh, uh, the mass movement of protests. Mm. And these strikes were a key to organizing uh, what later became known as the Egyptian Spring. Now, of course, we remember the official position of the United States and other governments from the West with regards to the Arab Spring. When the people marched on the streets demanding that fundamental change occurs, um, the U.S. government did not respond. Its response was careful, you know, saying something as we should respect the rights of protesters. And we know these are empty words if they come from the mouth of an American official. Um, and the uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak government, in the case of Egypt, the former president, or no, the, 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 dictate, the uh, president before Morsi, who was deposed in the revolution, um, was not immediately criticized by the United States. They were basically sitting and waiting to see what would happen. Would he be defeated by the revolution or would the revolution defeat him? When they finally realized that there was no way back for Hosni Mubarak, they started making all these great speeches about democracy in the Middle East and how the United States will always stand by the Egyptian people mm -hmm. in their pursuit of democracy. Well, if these words are correct, then there is a great... Uh, contradiction in the fact that the United States has almost unconditionally supported the regime of Hosni Mubarak for decades. In fact, uh, Egypt uh, under Hosni Mubarak and now still is de facto, but under Hosni Mubarak was the country that received the second largest amount of military aid from the United States. And what was the form of that military aid? This is very important to realize. Egypt did not receive inter- uh, uh, continental ballistic missiles from the United States, nor any other type of weapon that Egypt could use to defend itself against, say, Israel or any other foreign aggressor. It were weapons and arms, arms that could be used in quelling protests. And the Egyptians that died in the revolution against Hosni Mubarak were killed using Dutch, so the, the Netherlands is also involved, American and other Western weapons and vehicles. Um, anyway, Hosni Mubarak uh, 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 had to be deposed, the U.S. government realized, as well as the Egyptian establishment. And therefore, there was a, an, a, a shuffle of puppets. Hosni Mubarak was taken mm -hmm. away. And um, those who received power afterwards were the military of Egypt. Um, unfortunately, as a result of the miseducation that many Egyptians have received and the misguided nationalism that they were subjected to, uh, you know, nationalism is very key to mobilizing um, uh, the Americans to wage a certain war or to be willing to pay taxes to the government. And it's also an, a key uh, uh, in the Egyptian game of power. As a result of that, the many Egyptians did not realize that putting the military in charge is the same as having Hosni Mubarak in, tar in charge. Mm -hmm. Um, later on, elections were organized. Uh, Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood won. And the reason that Morsi won was not because of some sort of conspiracy. The reason is actually very simple. First of all, the Muslim Brotherhood was 
simply the best organized popular movement in Egypt. This is why they were able to uh, win the elections. Uh, and they achieved that popular support after decades and decades of organization. I'm not a fan of the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, I'm an opponent of the Muslim Brotherhood for many reasons. Mm -hmm. But what we do learn from the Muslim Brotherhood is that if you want to achieve some sort of power, and this is what we need to strive to as ordinary people, we need to take power into our own hands, then one, it is possible to gain that power, Two, upon the condition of organizing yourself with ordinary people politically. And this is what the Muslim Brotherhood did. This is why they were able to win the elections, which was made easier because the uh, secular, uh, uh, say, left-leaning opponents of the Muslim Brotherhood were not united nor very well organized, uh, certainly not in terms of their connection with uh, ordinary uh, Egyptians, you know, the people about which all activism should uh, should evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, revolve. Um, now, the Morsi government was not opposed by the United States at all, I believe. Maybe they had some minor disputes, but uh, because the Morsi government was not going to change anything fundamental about e Egypt, the U.S. readily accepted the Morsi government. The World Bank promised all kinds of loans to the Morsi government, which only happens with U.S. approval, as you know. Yep. And the reason is that the Morsi government immediately said, uh, contrary to what they were saying when they were still uh, an opposition group with no chance of gaining power in Egypt uh, in terms of governing the country, they said, we espouse to free market economics, i.e. neoliberalism in Egypt, which allows the control of Egypt by multinational corporations and a small group of Egyptian elites to the detriment of the average e Egyptian, one, they also accepted all the international agreements that Egypt had signed under Hosni Mubarak, which is basically guaranteeing that Israel is uh, 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 never uh, criticized or put under pressure and guaranteeing that Egypt continues to be a very important ally of the United States, which explains, by the way, why it received such generous, for decades, such generous uh, military aid. Now, Another change occurred in Egypt, and that, that is that the military, uh, for reasons of their own, decided that they must get rid of Morsi and rule the country themselves directly. And uh, what they did is necessarily in this case to crush the popular support of Morsi. Again, whether yeah. you agree with Morsi or not, he was supported by a major section of the Egyptian population. And these people uh, uh, staged protests in support of the candidate that they had elected in uh, open and fair elections. And the military responded by killing them. Hundreds of yeah. people, supporters of Morsi, have been shot, again, using American weapons. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, many, many Egyptians, I don't know the numbers, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's in the thousands now, um, are now being put in jail, uh, subjected to torture, subjected to uh, unfair trials. Where is the critique of all of this of the American government? Why aren't they engaged in a, a, a PR campaign against the Egyptian government uh, the way they would in the case of, say, the Iranian government violating human rights? Right. And the reason is, I think, again, very simple, because they know... These folks, you know, the, Amer the Egyptian military, are our trustworthy allies, and they are simply doing what they need to do to gain power. And as long as the um, Egyptian military doesn't fundamentally alter Egyptian positions in international politics, the U.S. government will be content. Yes, yeah, sometimes, you know, an American official will appear on television saying, we call upon the Egyptian military to show some restraint. But that's just for the sake of PR. Absolutely. Now, uh, I hate to say this, but we're already out of time. I can't believe it. And uh, as we wrap up this uh, wonderful discussion today on the truth about the Iraq war, about American imperialism, I ask you, Ali, what if you could speak to every single person on the planet, what would be the message that you would want to tell everybody right now if everyone was listening? Act upon your ideals. That's what I would say. Um, I, I, I think if you would ask the average person in the world, do you want a peaceful, just society? They will say yes. 
regardless of their specific cultural, religious uh, background. Um, and what we and and most people in the world are engaged um, in resistance against empire on a daily basis. Yeah. Their mere existence and not dying because they struggle to feed themselves and their families is resistance. And what I hope is that um, more people will be willing to engage in resistance and organize themselves collectively in order to achieve what they think is a more just and equal society. And most importantly, because I know the listeners are American and Westerners, we have a great responsibility because we are privileged. We suffer from imperialism, we suffer from patriarchy, we suffer from racism, but usually not to the extent that people in the third world suffer yeah. from it. As a result of which, we have a little more space to organize ourselves and to demand that our governments do as we tell them. And in the final analysis, the greatest evil that is occurring in the world politically comes from imperialist governments like the United States. Okay, well, we got to wrap it up, and that was a great way to end. Thank you very, very much, Ali. And uh, everybody, we'll see you next week here on The Just Bernard Show on Revolution Radio. Thank you for listening. There is no denying the world is awakening. We see it in the global uprisings and demonstrations of the people around the planet and the new way of thinking and living that is arising naturally within each one of us and our communities. I have been a major player in this global shift and movement for over 20 years and have helped tens of thousands of people around the world change their lives and find their voice in order to help create the paradigm change we so desperately need. Join me here at Revolution Radio on the Just Bernard Show every Tuesday at noon Eastern Eastern Time for two hours of powerful interviews and discussion with some of the most influential visionaries of consciousness, alternative media, and suppressed knowledge. We promise to reveal the real matrix and empower your human experience.